Do I have to record anything? Nope, it's fine on your side. Uh, it, this was recorded. Okay. So, <laughs> hello, I'm here with Kira. Uh, that's Kaloum for another Café Rollista across oceans and borders. And uh, take a good look at my long hair. Hopefully those will be cut this afternoon uh, as we are reopening out of lockdown uh, until the next lockdown here in London. Kira, could you introduce yourself uh, briefly before we go into details? Yeah, sure. Um, hi. A queer non-binary. Yeah. Your your inter your signal was lost uh, quite a bit here. Oh, it's oh, no. it's my own internet which is unstable. What is going on? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna check with my wife. She might be on Spotify. So that's not messy at all today. I think I lost you. Okay, that should work better now. Sorry about that. So could you repeat? No you, could you repeat that, please? I'm, I'm so sorry. No problem. Um, hi, I'm Kira Legrand. I'm a queer non-binary game designer in Columbus, Ohio. Awesome. And uh, today, among many things, well, first of all, a uh, little spoiler alert for everyone. Uh, it's going to take a while before I, I find the time to edit it, but record, we recorded a film studies together about hackers with Phil Vecchione. Uh, that was great uh, as a first experience recording with you, and uh, that's a movie you have uh, a lot of love for, I think. I do. I love Hackers. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It, it just stands the test of time. But people will have to wait uh, for the actual film studies episode to, to hear more about that. But today, uh, you've got an ongoing Kickstarter. Oh, wait a second. I'm so all over the place today. We got a nice breaking question on Cafe Release, which is, what is your routine like at the moment uh, with everything that is going on at the moment? What's a typical day in the life of Kira? Oh, gosh. Um, I usually, honestly, it hasn't been too much different because um, before uh, quarantine started, I was working from home for like, I don't know, a year and a half. So I feel like I like transitioned from like office into homework and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm kind of used to working at home and being here a lot. Uh, so my routine, you know, coffee. Uh, recently shifting to matcha though, matcha green tea. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. And then I have lunch outside with the groundhogs because they're awake again. I have a groundhog that likes to climb my neighbor's tree stump, which is like six feet tall. And she'll sit up there and like peer at me over the fence. And we have started calling her the fuzzy dragon, fuzzy garden dragon. Because she looks like she's surveying her land. <laughs> Amazing. But uh, beside that, what's keeping you busy at the moment is your Kickstarter for No Fly, a solar punk RPG. Uh, so. What is no fly wall? Oh, it's fly softly actually. Um, fly softly uh, is my Kickstarter. I'm currently kickstarting, um, and it is a solar punk game about hybrid butterflies um, who go on their yearly migration in the near future from uh, West Virginia all the way down to um, Joaquin, Mexico, and it's kind of like about uh, you know doing doing something in the face of a solar punk uh, ecological future. So what's the concept actually behind solar punk? Because I, I'm not that familiar with it. My own uh, understanding, which might be entirely wrong, is that I, I guess it's what I'm missing with more recent Star Trek shows. It's that it's uh, solar punk. I guess it's kind of... Utopian, it's a, it's a, it's going away from the the cyberpunk and the the Blade Runner thing of over development and uh, no way to to cohabit between nature and and human beings. Uh, is that the the right uh, understanding of what is it? Yeah, it's sim 
that's similar. Um, there, I think there is some drift about what solar punk means. Um, sometimes I'm not quite sure what it means, but it is kind of under the cyberpunk umbrella. It is a cyberpunk genre. Um, and the main key elements are that you still kind of have all of the touchstones of the cyberpunk genre where like you have like an oppressive force um, there's usually class issues. Um, there is some kind of focus on technology and solar punk, it tends to be green technology, what we kind of call it now. Um, so solar, solar power or steam power, et cetera. Um, and the, the key kind of themes uh, that sh that, that's kind of different from cyberpunk is that it doesn't have to be utopian. Like fly softly is not utopian at all. There are rich people hiding away in domes that have more than everybody else. But um, there is some kind of like ecological theme or like environmentalism theme behind it. Um, that's kind of like about conservation or how humans interact with the environment or the tech is kind of like a little drifting into biopunk, which kind of flies awfully is. You play um, humans who have DNA of monarch butterflies. So like you're a human butterfly hybrid. So that's, that's kind of solar punk. There's a lot of different uh, things that classify as solar punk though. It's, it's like kind of like a, one of the wuxi cyberpunk genres, I think. <laughs> Which are often open to debates regarding what is and what is not and uh, what they, oh, they yeah. actually are. So uh, is, it, is it your first time writing a game in that sort of genre in solar punk or is it something you, you often did? Oh yeah, I, I didn't actually go into it with the intention that it was solar punk. It kind of just became solar punk. <laughs> Because I have a, you know, from our Hackers podcast, I have a love of cyberpunk. Um, so, and like stylistically, you know, uh, it's one of my favorite things um, and thematically. So this was kind of more like I read um, this book, uh, um, Staying with the Trouble, which really inspired this, this game. And then I started kind of getting into ecology and... I learned a little bit more about insects and I'm like, well, this is kind of becoming this kind of setting in my mind. And then it's just suddenly became solar punk. <laughs> so you play hybrid butterflies. What, what does that actually mean? Hybrids of what? Uh, humans and butterflies? Yeah. Yeah. You, it's, it, the, the basic setting is that you're, um, you're in these near future communities that are kind of like, they're called communities of compost. And they're called that because it's about kind of like uh, ideas of rejuvenation and recycling from um, from the dirt, like bringing things from from the dead back to life. Um, and uh, they're like kind of like these ideal communes. Like if you were to imagine like communes in the future that you would want to live in, of like people who are like hippies and progressive thinkers and scientists and um, just like all social, you know, all these, all these really cool people from all over the place, they form these communities because they want to do something about what's happening with ecological destruction in the world and like social issues and kind of the intersections of those things. And so one of the things that they do to, um, as they kind of progress in their communities is they create these hybrids called sims or symbionts. Um, and they take the DNA of vulnerable creatures in the world and they combine them with humans in order to kind of like preserve the culture of those creatures going forward, even if they were to die. And so one of the creatures they choose is the monarch butterfly because the monarch butterflies in the real world are endangered. They're like, um, their populations are going down in huge numbers for various reasons. Um, and so those are the characters that you play in the game. You play the Sim Monarchs. Does that mean, I mean, you're, you're already very busy with that one project and that current Kickstarter campaign. I don't know what are the, the goals in your campaign, but uh, does that mean there might be the possibility in other games or sequels to play other types of hybrids? There might be. I might include it in this game as kind of like an option. Um, I wanted this game to specifically kind of, to be like specifically about butterfly issues basically. Um, so the themes kind of follow like their migration through the corridors of like the Americas and like the butterflies in particular in the setting have the ability to talk with the dead. 
Um, and so you spend a lot of time speaking with ghosts and like negotiating um, with dead creatures or mutants um, to kind of help them live with humans as like, uh, it's kind of death stranding you, like as, as ecological disaster is happening, like time is kind of converging and like the fourth dimension is here and ghosts are becoming more prevalent in the world. So butterflies have like this unique power to speak with the dead. So they're, they're really valuable and useful for people for like negotiations as, as things change in the world. Where does that idea come from speaking with the dead? Is it uh, some type of popular uh, beliefs or legends regarding butterfly because that's, that, that's really coming out of nowhere for me uh, when we're talking about ecology, the hybrid, and suddenly, and you also talk with the dead, and I'm, I'm like, oh, wow, that's, that's cool, but where does it come from? Sure. Uh, well, butterflies, butterflies are like a potent symbol, right, for a lot of different things. Um, they're a symbol, they're kind of like a trans symbol, right, for um, transgender people. Um, because they go through a metamorphosis. And so like as a non-binary person, I really identify with that symbology of like a very quick life cycle where you essentially, you know, are one thing, a caterpillar, and then you turn into goo and then you become something else. <laughs> it's just really wild biology. Um, and so there's there's kind of that symbolism of like complete change and transformation. And then um, there's also a lot of, um, symbolic potence of butterflies and the dead with um, different uh, native people from the Americas, like uh, in America and in Mexico, um, and in Christian mythology too, like all kinds of mythologies where, um, like one good example is the day of the dead for in, in November in the harvest times um, is when the monarch butterflies show up down in Mexico. And so um, there's kind of a symbolic reference and tie in with like when the monarch butterflies return it's the spirits of the dead returning um, in time for the day of the dead. And did, did you add, I'm working now at the moment now, no, I guess I can introduce myself as a game designer, I read the first game yeah. and uh, I'm working on a second at the moment. Uh, what sort of your process do you come up with, with those concepts first or a, a system <laughs> to which you want, you, you have uh, concepts to apply to? Is there one which comes before the, the other? Uh, is it about the law and, and those concepts or is the sim system still important for you or how do you balance all of that? Oh, everything that you just said, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know uh, what kind of games you're designing. Are you kind of making like indie games or like 5e or? Not 5e. <laughs> <That's not for laughs> yeah. <sure. laughs> I mean, uh, uh, bless people who, lo who love 5e and, and likes to, to yeah. do stuff. Uh, it's, it's not my thing. So uh, my first one is a story game, uh, really. So it's very focused oh. on an experience. You 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 start at the end of a dungeon and the dungeon could be anything really it could be it could be a beehive it could be a spaceship uh, but you arrived at the end you defeated whatever was controlling it and you found some loot and you need to decide what to keep and what to get rid of preferably you keep what sparks joy and get, you get rid of, of what does not spark joy and then you're gonna find out if you survive and if you're gonna have a fulfilling life thanks to the objects you, you kept. So it's, it's very structured and, and sort of narrow, but at the same time within that, uh, it's, it's very free form. And the mm -hmm. new game I'm working on, it's, it's a hack of Brindlewood Bay, which is a PBTA mm -hmm. game in which you play mm -hmm. elderly ladies uh, who are investigating murders, uh, a la murder she wrote, but there might be a Call of Cthulhu type of uh, cult going on. Uh, going on there so i'm gonna add that to another type of setting and also with a, a few different concepts uh, getting aware of the coziness so so me personally that that's where i stand otherwise i started role-playing game with uh air quote thread yeah. games yeah cool yeah i i mean i it, it's it's weird like with games i think i have this a holistic approach to game design, which is like, uh, 
I, I have like a visual arts background. So I often will come, like will be inspired by just that kind of multiple things that are going on in my life or media that I'm consuming or, you know, something I read like for Fly Softly, it was this book that really inspired me by Donna Haraway. Um, and then I kind of like, I'm like, oh, this would be, a, this is a game. Like, obviously this is a game for these reasons. And then I'll kind of begin converging that main idea with like other concepts and ideas. So like, oh, I want to make a game about hybrid butterflies that's talking about, you know, conservation and has like cool kind of futuristic vibes. So like, what would that look like? And what would the characters do in the game? And then I kind of, I like character focused games. I like, like you maybe like with story games, story games don't have to be character focused, but that's yeah, my favorite kind of Yeah, I like a character story. focused personally also, yeah. I'm, I'm not great. Yeah. My first game is, is GM-less, but I actually don't like GM-less game that much. Uh, it's not a judgment yeah. on their quality, a question of taste. I prefer to remain in first person or care so much more about my character rather than sit down with three people and say, okay, what is the story going to be like? Hmm, that reminds me of my day of working as an architect in a committee <laughs> designing something. I don't like that, actually. Right. No, I hear you. Um, I... I like all kinds of games actually, um, mechanically. Uh, I do have a preference for character immersion that I like going in and out. And I like being the GM. Like I like guiding players through a story and playing multiple characters. So I think GMless games are kind of like, you're just the GM all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so you, you're, you're the GM all the time, but at the same time, you... <sighs> I mean, again, designing stuff as a group, it's a question of leadership. If if you are good with it that, is. if you're in a group where it works very well, that's great. But uh, GM less game, you're the GM all the time, but you don't have the, uh, you don't have someone with the authority to make the decisions and keep things moving forward fast. You need to, it's a constant negotiation, which is not what I favor personally. As a, as a budding non-hierarchical anarchist, I think I prefer uh, lateral collaboration. <laughs> but it is important to, in, like you're right, it is important in GMS games to kind of have, to make sure you kind of have this shared authority so that I, everyone I is like making decisions. I like lateral involvement, but, but yeah. I like decision, <laughs> delegated decision making, but. Yeah. <laughs> I think you find that in our no, community. I, I hear you. <laughs> What's that? I think you still find that in the anarchist communities. You know, you got probably different group with different specialism. People have a lot of misconceptions. I'm not very lectured with anarchy, but I do know that anarchy is not that thing people think it is in popular culture or in the described in the mainstream. Um. No, I agree. It's I'm, like, I'm mostly an archie in the UK, sex pistols. <laughs> yeah, let's form a commune and take decisions together to the well being of each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sex pistols doesn't sound like that, oddly enough. Yeah, you, all, you still like have people who are in leadership positions, and you have experts, and you have like maybe a committee or a board or whatever like a group of people making decisions etc so yeah i hear you but uh, i like both of them but um i yeah I, so so character driven games I, it's kind of like for me games and it's funny because we, we were just on the film podcast too like i really like um i think of games as though they are stories that you're telling together as opposed to do like story games anyway, or role playing games, as opposed to like, um, you know, a video game or a board game where you're kind of just interacting with uh, mechanics a lot of the time. Um, and so I like kind of like this idea of like, oh, it's like a film or a TV show or, um, or a more, more of those than a book, right? And so I think a lot of my game design is kind of like centered around those concepts of like, how can we make this cinematic? How can we make it like a film? How can we showcase all these characters in a story? And for those reasons, like, and, you know, character development, I think I really am drawn to like Power by the Apocalypse games. Um, I think that the, the mechanics um, really drive 
uh, those kinds of stories really well and support people in telling those types of stories instead of like having to rely on everyone, you know, kind of preforming and making everything up all the time. There's kind of like direction and, and guidelines and boundaries and borders to help your creativity like blossom. Uh, so I think th those those are super cool. I find I find myself constantly going back to those <laughs> those <laughs> mechanics. I'm still not over. I know it's, it's probably not trendy anymore. I'm just, I'm still not over it. And like, I mean, you know, Blades in the Dark, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of spinoffs now, but I, I still haven't seen anything that I'm like, yeah, this does the same thing with story and characters that Powered by the Apocalypse does. Well, I quite like the, at the moment, uh, well, th there's always this moment at some point when it, when it's trendy, when the, there's a lot of people who are really enthusiastic and sometimes they might oversell it or sell it to, to the wrong people or the wrong way. So I had that with fate. Hearing a lot of people saying it was the thing and then powered by the apocalypse, and it tends to be a, a bit of a turn off for me, especially when uh, when I'm told, Oh, it's simple, and I don't find powered by the apocalypse simple, it's different, but it's not, I don't find it simpler than traditional games, it, it's different, it's less math, but it's more other stuff. But, um, where was I going with that? I agree, it's <laughs> yeah, well, no, what I really like at the moment, I find this, uh, you know, in the movement of the pendulum, uh, it's kind of going back with Powered by the Apocalypse, but that means we got a lot, I guess it's thesis, antithesis, if Trad Games were sort of the thesis and PBTA was the antithesis, right now we had the synthesis with stuff which are exploring different corners of that same concept, again, Brindlewood Bay, Forge in the Dark, uh, and other games, they try different stuff and at the same time they perfected the ideas which sprout out of Powered by the Apocalypse, I, I find. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's really interesting, well, I think that people have different takes on Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, like, you know, when Apocalypse World was made, uh, two different people played it and got different, um, got excited about different parts of it and then we got dungeon world and monster hearts right <laughs> two completely different games <laughs> and uh i think that's kind of one of the coolest things about power by the apocalypse is like kind of how you can interpret it and utilize the rules for what you want to build it's a really good tool set um and it allows for i mean it just has so much focus on the characters that's about the characters 100 percent like the mechanic, you spend so much time uh, like lovingly kind of crafting your character in this way that is more story driven uh, than numbers driven. Like you have these relationships that you make, even in Ap Apocalypse World itself, which I agree with you is very crunchy. It's like a very trad game in a lot of ways. Um, there's like so many rules and like combat is, is like a trad game combat. I mean, it's like mostly combat rules. Um, and despite the fact that it's a story game, right? Like most of the things that you're doing is combat. Um, and yeah, versus like Monster Hearts where most of the things you're doing is like, I don't know, emotional. And, uh, you know, I think even The Veil is like a Powered by the Apocalypse spinoff, which is very light, very rules light. Um, Fly Softly is kind of like a take on Power by the Apocalypse and Blades in the Dark. It's kind of like taking those basic rule sets and um, deconstructing them into like very simple parts that focus on the key emotional beats that I want to hit with the game, right? Like you're focusing on um, doing supernatural things and uh, having like emotional hit points basically. <laughs> So that's, that's how like the stats are structured. That's how the moves are structured. Um, it, it's just like, I think it's a really beautiful, elegant tool set. I, I like uh, emotional hit points. It's a bit like uh, Mask the New Generation. They, they worked out that, no, no, you cannot manage superheroes with health points. That's ridiculous. I, I should punch you in the feelings. That's where it works. <laughs> Punching people in the feelings is the best place to punch them in role playing games. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's how you can hurt even people like Superman. You could, can go up to him and say, hey, you look stupid. And you hurt his feelings. Yeah. It's better than Kryptonite. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. It's funny. I think, um, I think with game design, you know. Oh, are you okay? 
Don't die. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't tell what's happening because I think you lagged out. Yeah, I switched myself off because I was coughing. I was saying, no, I don't want to die today. I need, okay. to get, I need an haircut first. I don't want to die with that hair. Um, <laughs> haircuts are important. <laughs> Dying is not, not a good plan for, for Monday. <clears throat> Especially when you die, your hair still grows. Um, so you really want a haircut first. Oh my God. <laughs> I forgot about that. That's really... That's a really interesting and strange fact. <laughs> I, I, totally, I totally forget what I was talking about. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what uh, in uh, Fly Softly do, do you have adventures which are included in the Kickstarter? Is there a starting adventure? What, oh, yeah. what, what do you do actually when you are those hybrids <laughs> butterfly flying uh, all the way to, to Mexico? So that's one of my one of my favorite parts about Apocalypse World Games, powered by the Apocalypse Games, is I do think it makes GMing easier. I know that people feel different ways about this, um, but it was the first game where I was like, "Oh, I don't have to stat up NPCs. Amazing!" <laughs> oh yeah, that's great. That's <laughs> like, that's where it's easier. That's definitely. Yeah, or and you can kind of just like go with the flow. Like your job as the GM is kind of just to support. The characters and bringing out the most the most drama for them so all you have to do is figure out okay what matters to this character how can i make it difficult or interesting for them um so but one of the things that i that i wish i had more of for gm support um in games in general wasn't like necessarily like a story like, I don't want like a, you know, a 10 page adventure that I have to read through and know like point to point what all the story, you know, beats are. Um, what I want kind of is like structure. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I get the kind of idea of this game and what the setting might be, but like, what even is actually happening? Who are the characters, et cetera? Um, the NPCs, like what, what, what are the themes maybe of the adventures that you go on? And so I try to build that in this, and um, went a little wild and built <laughs> like, <laughs> there's four different settings like that are kind of like way stations on your way south. Um, and then uh, there's within those settings like three to four different um, kind of like adventure scenarios that then inside of them have like multiple uh, like specific scenarios within like that themed adventure. So like, for example, you might be at the New Gali way station, which is where you start out in future West Virginia. And then within there, you might have to deal with, um, you know, the mountaintop ghosts. And then within the mountaintop ghosts kind of like setting, you have like, oh, there's this problem with an old um, dead ancestor from one of the main characters who you have to go talk to someone is getting married um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're causing all this drama in the community. Um, there's a butterfly ghost who uh, is suddenly eating way too much milkweed and all the other butterflies are starting to suffer because of it. You have to go talk to them. Um, so it's kind of like structured like that. And there's like different NPCs that are kind of loosely described and have stats of their own that kind of like give you bonuses or negatives depending on how you interact with them. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like a loose structure for the GM to kind of look at and work with and be like, I can choose any of these ideas that I want to, they're all here for me. And I have all these NPCs I can work with. I don't have to make any of them up on the fly. Um, and like, you can kind of just sit down with that and go. It's kind of a uh, based, kind of loosely around um, like Monster Hearts Towns from Monster Hearts 2E. I wrote one of those too. Um, I think that's like a good structure, basic structure. Like here's the drama, here's the NPCs. Um, and um, the islands in Aegon, which I also wrote for. <laughs> I, I basically like play and write a lot of games and it, uh, it just kind of helps me understand and gives me ideas for structure that I can kind of like remix and, and utilize um, in ways that I would like to use it. So that, that's kind of like, that's a long answer. 
<laughs> I'm all here for like long here. answers. That's that's what I call a good customer in terms of guests. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, just throw a question and, and then go. It's funny when you describe it. <laughs> it reminded me uh, the idea of you travel and you find a situation in a place and then you move away of that place uh, with the situation uh, change through your... So it reminded me of the TV show. Uh, uh, well, to some extent, Hulk, the old TV show was a bit like that. Oh, or, oh, uh, or, hi or highway to, ev to heaven uh, with the character traveling between places and, and then uh, sorting things out for, for people a bit. Um. Yeah, it's actually, um, I recently started watching Mushishi, which I don't know oh, if you've yeah. ever seen it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's very similar to Mushishi and I, um, had, I hadn't watched it before and I was like, oh, wow, this is kind of like my game. <laughs> I like that format, the episodic format of you show up in a place, you do something, and then you leave the place. I guess that's sort of a bit of that idea in Dungeons and Dragons, but it's not really mm -hmm. fully explored. And it's more, it's less you travel to a place and then you find out, oh, that's what this place is about, and that is what is going on. I guess in the typical dungeon crawling game, it's more, no, you go there with the intent of doing that thing there. And you, you like a tornado passing through the place rather than, yeah, travel and be, oh, oh, this is happening in the, here. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Well, maybe I can help or oh, maybe I cannot help. But you and then you move out of the place. That's that's a very convenient way of refreshing things between adventures and at the same time not having. I mean, you need you don't need as much to deal with the consequences of what has been happening you can still keep things contained yeah yeah i think um i really i love the idea of traveling in games i think it's really cool i think it's kind of it's like one of the keystones of not only like the fantasy sci-fi genre but also of role-playing games in general like just because of what you said like with our you know the history of D D. Um, but, uh, in Fly Softly, you will travel, the, the story is kind of like you travel and, and migrate through these corridors every year. And every year you're building kind of more and more connections with the people who you're helping, um, which is kind of builds like these reciprocal relationships between you. And so like you kind of help them out, um, in ways that you can with whatever means that you have, you know, in this, in this story, the Sim Monarchs have like their supernatural abilities that nobody else has. So they can talk to ghosts, they can, um, you know, see the coming weather, they have high empathy, etc. cetera. Um, and in exchange, um, the people there, you know, they become friends, they help them, um, maybe they become kin or they become family in some way. And then you build connections and they plant milkweed for you. And so, um, you know, in exchange, they're kind of helping uh, the ensure the future of the sim monarchs and the monarch butterflies. So it's kind of like this idea of like, if you, it's like a metaphor, right? Like if, if we want to try and fix things, if we want to build a better ecology, better social systems, um, better connections with people and the land, you kind of have to um, do what you can to help each other. Uh... What was I thinking? Uh... <laughs> I just said a lot. That, no, no. Dr that drifted into. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I sort of zoned out. Uh, the... No, I was thinking that I, I really like the idea of not only it's contained, so you got different places and you keep it fresh between sessions, but that mm -hmm. you would. You would have your, I don't know, your, your second sort of set uh, across, I don't know, many sets. You have your five sets. And then when you have gone through a cycle, you come back to the second set and you're like, oh, I came to this place and I planted a tree there, uh, I don't know, X yeah. years ago. And you come back and the tree is grown or you can see how NPCs you've met, they, they've grown up, they, they got kids or kids are adults now and they're getting together, some... Some left, some arrived, but you can have. I really like. I think we don't play enough with time often in role playing games. Uh, I like how many games are rediscovering flashbacks, but I like also the idea mm -hmm. of fast forward. And sometimes we are too shy to say, 
okay, one week later or one month later, instead of, and you wake up the next day, what do you do today? You know, uh, just, just show me the, you, you can show the impact of the actions of your characters or the, the lack of impact from their actions because they, they did not manage to make a meaningful change in the place. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of um, being able to play with time is definitely a part of the game. You can skip ahead or you can cycle through again, depending on how many sessions you play. Um, and it's the, I love the idea of generational play as well. I think it's really cool and not, not very many games do it. In, in Fly Softly itself, you start in the spring and you end up uh, in the fall, uh, fall slash winter. So you do kind of have like a timeline which um, is partially inspired by Night Witches. I don't know if you've played Night Witches. Um, I'd really I like to try Star. Night Witches. Uh, I, love, yeah. I love games which are set in historical settings and engage with them. So, and I love, yeah. I love airplanes, I love World War II history. So Night Witches, it's like for me, but I did not fo seek a proper opportunity to play it yet. Yeah, I, I play tested it um, when it was coming out and kind of helped a little with the design. Um, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, what I love, one of the things I love about it is it kind of gives you like, okay, you're at um, this airport uh, at this time period, you know, before or after this battle. Um, here's the specific space of time that you're in. Uh, and I think that is so cool. Like if you have like a, a, a travel game where you're kind of moving through time or a story to be like, okay, here's the specific scene that you're at now. Uh, it just does that really well for me so that you're not like day to day. You're kind of like, okay, we're here. We're going to move through this. This is one session. And then the, ne the next session, it's going to be months later. And yeah, that's super cool. Pendragon does that too. Um, I don't know if you've ever played Pendragon, uh, where you move, through, yeah, you move through generations. You like have kids and you roll to see like how many of your kids survive. And like, you might die in different battles. You have new characters you can play um, from your family or heirs that you can play, et cetera, et cetera. You kind of like build up your house as you're a knight, you know, if you, if you, you get a certain amount of like money to spend from battles that you survive and you can be like, oh, I'm building a, a new, a new mansion or I'm whatever they're called for knights. I can't remember. Or, you know, I, I now have an apiary and a garden and I've had my, my wife has had five kids while I've been gone. And, you know, <laughs> one of, one of them is 10 now and that kind of thing. Um, which, yeah, it's, it's super cool. We sh I think we should do that more in games, I agree. So does that mean, well, there's a question in the chat room from uh, Julien Poir from um, mm. Voix d'Altari in, in France, game designer as well. Julien, you need to remind me the, the title of your game so you can plug it. But he's asking, um, in your Fly Softly, do you play the actual travel as well? Or do you, do you uh, jump between locations in terms of play time? You don't play the travel. So, I, and I think that's different. Like I, uh, a lot of games do play, it is a kind of about the travel between the places, right? Like you're camping and you have an encounter at night. Um, but with this, you kind of jump between places and the action happens at the places or around them. Uh, so like you might be, um, you know, again, in the New Gali setting, but you, not everything happens like within the, the settlement, you would also be, you know, in the nearby creeks and corridors and um, old mountain mines uh, or like nearby towns. Um, like there's uh, the near the kind of like these setups with like conflicts between, um, you know, a small agricultural town and a, a big, um, uh, you know, industrial uh, agricultural complex that owns them. Um, and like a, the, the rich dome settlement that's kind of like uh, completely enclosed from the outdoors and they live inside. And so there's kind of like these adjacent set up settings that are like around the main settings, like these little bubbles. So do you, do you also, in, I mean, that's travel to space, but when you come back to places, you, you mentioned generational games. I'm thinking of games like Legacy, uh, Life Among the Rings. Do you, do you have uh, a system mm. in place or things which gives you prompts or 
resolve situation tells you okay these are the sort of things we change in between and and then you come up with what actually happened or is it up to the game master and the player to to sort of it's a little it? looser than that yeah it's a little looser than that because the, the game itself isn't really centered around generational play it's mostly centered around the travel um through like if you can get to mexico that's that's a, you've gone through a lot of the game <laughs> So the, the games, just uh, to plug uh, Julien's game, a lot of them are in French. It's Le Temple des Vents. J Julien, you need to work on uh, an English oh, yeah. translation. And we got Richard also in the room who <laughs> recently released Fantasy Adventure on itch.io. So please go check it out. I'm trying to to copy paste some in the, in the chat room. Uh, cool. Yeah, that sounds well, awesome. That, we, got, we still got a, a tiny bit uh, of time. Uh, I, I guess we're bound to discuss that because we discussed it before the recording. Uh, you sent me a nice uh, video essay about Daria in the 90s, and we've been talking a bit about that with <laughs> with hackers. <laughs> Did you have some thoughts uh, a tool about the 90s you, you wanted to share? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's so fun. Uh... Gosh, the, what did I watch recently that was very 90s? Oh, I can't even remember. I, I feel like I feel like actually the 2000s are like trendy again. It's like like it's kind of almost like um I don't know. The 90s are a little bit of like this lost time right now where like it, it feels almost like it doesn't exist in, in like our popular consciousness. Like it's like you either have the 80s or I don't know now. Maybe the late two thousands or but early two thousands. I guess there's the thirty year cycles they keep talking about. So supposedly, but, but, but it's true that the eighties seems to have been brought back much stronger than the nineties. At the same time, in the video essay you mentioned, it, it seems that the the sort of nostalgia for the nineties was weaker, but it came way earlier than usual. Uh, in the 2000s, it it sort of happened in the 2000s. Uh, it's true, I think. It's it's weird, you know. I I've been, I mean, because that's for you know, I was that's my teenage years, the the 90s, and uh, yeah, I was okay. thinking about how it was for me then, and uh, especially as a, a European, and it's it's a bit difficult to think back to that because yeah, this. this there was sort of optimism and positivity, which. I mean, it was not in the spirit of the time, but looking back, there were reasons to be optimistic and so on. Uh, I mean, for from my point of, from point of view, from a European citizen, that was really the heydays of the European of the European Community, no European Union. You know, whether we were twelve, it was the the space program, it was the opening of Eurotuna and Eurostar, even even Euro Disney to a lesser extent. But there were a lot of uh, optimism and enthusiasm regarding the European Union. And now, even though I'm a Euro optimist, I guess, I look at things and I'm like, <laughs> hmm, things are, things are difficult. <laughs> in the bad place and the way out of troubles is, uh, is, is difficult to, to get out. And, uh, and yeah, and, and, yeah. The, and the US, that was your window between, um, between conflicts. So. Rail, yeah, rail. it's, it's, I mean, well, I mean, we had the, uh, we, we were at war in the nineties, weren't we? We were constantly, isn't that when we were in Iran and Iraq? Uh, first Gulf know. War. So Iran. Gulf War. Yeah. The first Gulf War in Iraq, Iran, I think that would have been the eighties, even, may, even maybe the late seventies, but it's the end of the cold war and. I guess the first war in Iraq was a very remote conflict. I guess it was the first sort of so-called, absolutely not, but so-called uh, surgical warfare. And uh, yeah, you had the Balkans also, which and Yugoslavia, which were much more important for Europeans than it was for the US, although the Clinton administration got involved there. But it was... Yeah, it, it was not on the U.S. soil, and probably less, yeah, much less victims uh, in the U.S. military. 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The nineties are super weird. I, like I, I, I'm so I'm biased obviously about my nineties experience, probably the same way you are as a teenager. Um, you know, Daria was my teenage experience. I was a goth teenager, uh, you know, as, as a zenial, technically, I'm, I'm a zenial or whatever. I don't know. Generations are all made up. But, uh, you know, my, my teenage, it was popular to be, like, angsty. You know, Nirvana was popular. You know, there was the Dropkick Murphys, Nine Inch Nails. Uh, <laughs> it was, like, that was the cultural legacy at the time, right? Um uh, for me, and and so it's really weird uh, thinking about the '90s in in a lens of like, oh, everything was was pretty great and hopeful. The Daria the Daria essay was super cool because I think it captured that that idea that like of um, uh, of the youth culture at the time, how how even though things were kind of prosperous in the U.S., um, everything was still kind of the worst. Uh, you know, there was kind of this existential emptiness <laughs> that teenagers could feel, <laughs> even even though all all these good things were happening. Um, you know, ec economically, uh, that didn't that didn't make our lives better. I think that's it's like a a really interesting look at the failures of capitalism um, as it is structured. You know, as it was structured then, as it is still structured now. We're in like now we're in hyper capitalism or whatever, you know, it's, it's even worse. You got fucking Elon Musk. Um, yeah, it's, it's just wild to think about every, every time I think about Elon Musk, I get angry. Like he wants to go, you know, he wants to go to fucking Mars, but can't spend money like protecting the world that we have. It's, uh, it's just like infuriating, it, you know, <laughs> that's, that's like the world that we live in now. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I've got even, uh, professional issues with Elon Musk because he's presented as this genius and I mean I'm not aware of all he's these not. ideas he's, he's stupid he's, he's an idiot like the the, the boring company uh, I'm a professional in transport that's a completely dumb idea you know, you know? and even when they make demonstration it's when you can observe things uh, to a minimum, which is what most people and what most media won't do, it's clearly not working. It doesn't make any sense to, to get people in cars, in tunnels. And yeah, it's... Yeah. yeah. It's like, a, it's a build, build a fucking train. <laughs> like, <laughs> we need train systems. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, I hate that. I hate this guy. It's... I mean, if he's it's, watching... It's it, infuriating. Yeah, and it's one of those, I mean, it's those uh, Ayn Rand things of, you know, I dream yeah. sometime of uh, a website. It would be a bit like, uh, kind of like EMDB, but it would list celebrities. You could even do it just with entertainment, with cinema, uh, just with actors. But I'd like a website which visually colors and references the advantages at birth that people had to be successful in that industry so all the people oh, we yeah. <laughs> yeah you know all the people we present as self-made people like bill gates uh elon musk and then you you know i, I was started yeah i'm watching because uh i'm full like everyone uh, I'm, I'm full of paradox uh i really like uh, falcon and the, the winter soldier despite yeah, everything, I'm watching it too. despite everything and in there <laughs> there's uh an actor who is very good who is the son of uh, uh dennis quaid no wait uh no uh the other one uh, is the son of kurt russell and goldion and oh or, or meg ryan uh, whatever he's the son of another actor and i was like oh i don't like that one is the son of another actor <laughs> And, and then I go back to watching older movies or the video I saw about a movie, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. actually, Drew Barrymore <laughs> is the daughter of John Barrymore. And all those people yeah. are aristocracies of in, <laughs> in fields. So all those people you see, like, oh, he's a great actor, and he became great, a great actor. He got these opportunities because they were great at their craft. No, 
No, no, either they were loaded from mo with money from day one, like uh, Arnie Hammer, who's really loaded, or they, they're part of a, a family or of performers, which on one extent it's fine, because if you go back to, I don't know, circus and stuff like that, they would be families and that family tradition. But on the other hand, no, actually it means it's very difficult if you train as an actor and got a passion to become an actor, to become successful when you're coming from nowhere, you're very unlikely to get that because there's already the children of this person and that person crowding the area. You got the, I mean, Carrie Fisher, she is the daughter of Debbie Reynolds. <laughs> mm hmm Yeah, meritocracy is a lie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's such a lie, a, a popular trope also. It's, um, it's very interesting. Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the, I, I'm grateful actually for being a Zenial, for the ability to question authority and, um, you know, uh, uh, recognize and understand systems. I feel like uh, that, that was a huge part of Generation X, which doesn't get mentioned a lot of the time, like the ability to be like, oh, you know, you, you know, we shouldn't necessarily believe what people in charge are telling us. <laughs> we think... shouldn't trust institutions uh, necessarily. You know, so systems are not designed to help all of us. They're designed for, you know, sometimes maliciously, uh, you know, like Twitter, for example. <laughs> Um, and I, I think it's just, you know, it, it's such a huge theme of cyberpunk too, like being able to see, you know, the matrix of the system around you and be able to, you know, poke through maybe the lies that like your bias or the people in charge might be telling you is the truth. I mean, we, we already had a bit of, of that discussing hackers, so... Uh, labels of generations they, they are extremely flawed but uh, you, you don't think that millennials uh, have that and actually might have that in a stronger and maybe more proactive ways than uh, than with it because i'm a xenial as well <laughs> oh yeah millennials um I, i've worked with younger generations actually for a while i used to work at an art college and so i would see you know i, I would work a lot with teenagers and um, see their unique ability to navigate uh, techno technological systems, um, all the technological systems that exist now, right? That I think um, older people don't have quite the same ability to do. Um, and to specifically zero in on like, okay, I'm reading these 10 things, which of them is the truth? Um, because we have like information overload now. And I, th I think that that is like a strength of younger generations currently, which is really good. I think that's really important moving moving forward to be able to, to see through the bullshit, especially in our age of, um, you know, master master bullshitters and misinformation. That's that's kind of like the superpower that we need people to have. Yeah, hopefully the, the, they will have that uh, before they turn into hybrids uh, with butterflies. <laughs> uh, you mentioned in our film study that you were working also on a hackers inspired game what was that a uh, fly softly or was it another game that you are developing and that might be coming oh it's a different game it's actually much older i feel like it's my white whale because it oh. needs to be perfect <laughs> it's like one of those games you know what i mean <laughs> um i work yeah i'm working on it for like four years or something stupid but it's um it's called sync uh and it has a lot in common with hackers um, and Mr. Robot and um, William Gibson Cyberpunk in that you kind of play normal people, um, but you have the ability to manipulate technology. Um, so it's not like a fighty guns cyberpunk game. It's like a hacking tech cyberpunk game. Um, and it's kind of about like, how can you help the people around you and your own communities um, survive, you know, in the cyberpunk dystopia? <laughs> Which doesn't remind at all of uh, our current situation. Yes, I mean, it's, it is our current situation. William Gibson is, uh, you know, our prophet. <laughs> if you read William Gibson books, you can see five years into the future. <laughs> Great. Uh, uh, do you have anything else to add uh, about uh, Flight Softly or another project uh, before, before we part? Because we are close to the one hour mark. I don't. Um, I mean, just go check out my Kickstarter. Um, Fly Softly is a super weird game that I'm really proud of. Um, it's, ve it's very different. Uh, you know, it's about it's about a serious 
environmental ecological issues, um, which I think a lot of people, you know, it's hard, it's hard to sit with those concepts and um, I, I wanted it to be something that was fun, engaging, storytelling, um, sad and hopeful. Uh, so it's kind of like a lot of different things um, kind of all together and I'm really proud of it. It's, it's like a very beautiful kind of contained game. So um, please go, please go take a look at the Kickstarter. Yeah, please do. I now will include a link in the description of this episode in uh, I posted a link also in the chat room right now, but uh, I will include a link in the description of the, the episode on YouTube. If you're hearing that on our podcast feed, it might be too late for the Kickstarter because usually those take a, a while before they're out. Do you think people will still be able to do late pledges or this sort of things? Oh yeah, you can, I think uh, after Kickstarter is over now, it's been two years since I've made one, but I think you can keep uh, pledging um, and still have access to it. So for sure. And if it's not a Kickstarter anymore, it'll definitely, you know, be all the places that you can buy role-playing games like itch.io and IPR. Amazing. And while you're there, my own plug, if you're on itch.io, I've released my very first game, Paris Gondo, The Life-Saving Magic of Inventoring. Uh, we're currently trying to raise $500 to pay for a graphic designer and uh, within a couple of weeks we reach 410 so we're very close to the end of uh, that goal so that's really exciting so please go go check it out it's been play tested with a lot of people and they did have fun it did spark joy so yeah uh thank you so much kira uh i really it's a pleasure chatting with you and uh i, I look forward to recording more film studies and all the stuff with you i think uh, i will make that happen so it's certainly something inspired by uh or in relationship to night witches that would be uh that would be very cool i think oh sure the aviator is a great movie cool yeah about uh genius people who are self-made men like um <laughs> what's his name no i got it on the tip of my tongue uh, oh it's an older the older one the black and white one. Oh yeah okay not the uh not uh, the not leonardo dicaprio <laughs> yeah no, not the, what's his name oh come on uh what hoax not the uh, what hoax uh predecessor to uh uh elon musk yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, um. <laughs> yeah, when you said the aviator that the movie I told of, and I was like, mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> 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 probably not this one. Probably more Poco Rosso. Poco Rosso is probably going to happen at some point. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone, in the chat room. There were a lot of people today. That's really, really cool, uh, including King of Demons. Please go check. Uh, his or their uh, Twitch channel. Bye, everyone!